My name is D. Hankins. By title, I'm an inspirational speaker. By title. Honestly, I'm just a regular person who lived an interesting life, and I love sharing it with people with the hopes that it helps you, changes your viewpoint, or helps you to help someone else. All right? Uh, on top of being an inspirational speaker, I'm a dad. All right, these are my kids. Yeah, absolutely. I love my children. Being a dad is probably one of the most difficult things that I've ever had to do in my life because I didn't have one. You know, and I was fortunate, well, I was in 12 different foster homes, meaning I get the opportunity to take 12 different perspectives on parenting over my life and apply it to how I raise my, my children, right? And that's how I became the dad that I am. It's because of the, the situations that I was in and I just pick and choose what I liked and what I didn't like. So far, so good. We'll see, right? But this is really me right here, right? <laughs> that guy dressed up as Spider-Man. I'm a geek. I'm a nerd. Growing up in foster care, superheroes were were the, the closest thing that I could, could look at and, and, and be inspired by, because superheroes had a story like me. Peter Parker, his uncle passed away. Uh, Bruce Wayne, Batman, his parents were no longer there. Shazam is actually a foster child. And so growing up, I drew inspiration from that. And now, as an adult, I go to Comic-Con and dress up as Spider-Man. That's who you get. That's who's on stage, right? Absolutely. So, you know, it's funny because, you know, I'll go to schools and things like that, and, you know, these kids always ask one question to validate who you are, right? How many followers do you have, right? And if you don't have enough for them to be like, think you're somebody, then, you know, you're, you're, you're out of luck. But for me, I try to make sure that I am as human as I am as possibly as I can be, right? So today, in this session, I know all of you work so hard on your profession. Many of you have many degrees and you love those degrees. You sleep with those degrees. Those degrees are on your wall. Some of you have tattoos of your degrees because it took so much time. But in this session, for the next few minutes, your degrees, don't matter. As a matter of fact, your profession doesn't matter. I need you. I need mom, dads, uncles, cousins, sons and daughters, right? I need just the raw you. Because what I'm going to say to you, you can use in your profession. But if you come in here as a professional, you're going to try to analyze what I'm saying and dissect it and use all of your antonyms and acronyms and synonyms and cinnamons and all that, right? It's not going to work that way. I just need you as mom and dad, sister, brother, husband, and wife, the human you. And then let my words impact you, if you will, if you come in with an open heart, open mind. And then once that change starts to happen, then you can go on and take it to your profession. Then you can go on and take it to your school and your, the kids that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis. We all on the same page? Yeah? All right. My theme is threefold. Life, curveballs, and home runs, right? Life is your ultimate competitor. Life doesn't care who you are, what color you are, where you were born, when you were born. Life just keeps happening. And there's a lot of great things that happen in life and there's a lot of curveballs that it throws at us. Basically, life wants to see if you're really about that life, right? So it's going to do some things to you. It's going to throw you off your axis. It's gonna, gonna knock you off your square sometimes. Has anybody heard the saying, Life throws curveballs. Yeah, essentially what that means is this. One day, it's nice and sunny outside. The birds are chirping. You find $20 on the ground, right? All of a sudden it starts raining. 
those same birds that were chirping poop on your head. And then you realize that you wore your pants with the holes in the pocket, so you lost your $20. All right, that's like those curveballs. Now you can cry about it, right? Or you can say, it is what it is. Well, my life started off without me. I want to talk about my mom and dad for a second. And before I get to my mom and dad together, I want to talk about my mom. Mom is the unsung star of this show. My mom was the youngest of nine. She grew up in a time where one, it wasn't popular to be black. And two, it wasn't popular to be a black woman. But my mom was taking care of business because my grandpa, right, would tell my mom one thing every single day outside of I love you. Do what you need to do to get to where you want to go, right? Do what you need to do to get to where you want to go. I hold my mom in high regard because of my mom's mindset. She was well aware that we were poor, that we lived in a super small house and we didn't have much. She was well aware of that. But she knew that this is just chapter one. Chapter two and chapter three needed to be different. So she had an escape plan, education and finance. And my mom, although she knew she was in a place, in a, in a, born in a, in a place where literally Dr. King was marching on the street, fighting for civil rights. There was a lot of civil unrest. She knew that was happening, but I could make a change. I could make this different. So she had a plan, education and finance. I needed to get educated and I needed to have some money and use that money. So my mom was in school and she had like three jobs and she would literally wake up, go to school, go home, change, walk to her first job, work a shift, walk home, change, walk to her second job, work a shift. And if time permitted, walk home, go to her third job, sleep for two hours, wake up and do it all over again. That was my mom's life. And although it was hard and it was tough, she knew she had a mission. Chapter two had to be different. And everything in my mom's life was going great until she met my dad. Now I imagine it happened like this. My mom's walking out of class, right? And there in the distance, she sees this fine, chocolatey brother. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about. All right? I see you. I see you. Look, she's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> the difference between the two is my mom was using her gifts, her talents, and her skills to do what she needed to do to get to where she wanted to go. And my dad was wasting his. He was running the streets, he was doing drugs, he was in places he shouldn't be. But he didn't tell my mom that right off the bat, right? That'd be too convenient, right? What's your name? Oh, Patricia, what, what are you doing? Oh, I just got out of class, I'm gonna go eat lunch and then I'm gonna go to work. Can I join you? Absolutely, that'd be nice. Oh, by the way, I do drugs, right? It doesn't work out that way. But if you think about it, if we really interacted like that, we'd save a lot of time, right? Like when we go on dates, hi, my name is D. I don't do dishes, I don't wanna work. And from time to time, I'll probably smack you up. Like now you can sit there and be like, I'm good. I'm, instead of finding out five years later, right? Be honest, people, be honest. Well, my dad wasn't honest, but my mom fell in love with my dad. Now love is a scientific anomaly. Right? Nobody really knows what it is, but we know that it's real. And it makes you do a lot of great things, and it makes you do a lot of stupid, <laughs> all the ladies in here, stupid, stupid, stupid things. <laughs> well, my dad started doing, or my mom started doing some stupid things. Right? My dad, he she would literally stash my dad's drugs for him in her house which was a no-no for my grandparents, right? She started lying, she started sneaking out, she started doing everything that she was raised not to do. Now, when I talked to my mom about her story, she said, oh yeah, and your grandparents kicked me out. And I was just like, no, they didn't. There's a difference, right? And what I see it is this, my grandparents were like, hey, in this house, there's a few things that we do, 
and there's a few things that we don't do. And if you want to do the things that we don't do, you have to do that somewhere else. You can't do it here. Do you see the difference? There's a, hey, get out. We don't want you here. I think that's being kicked out. And there's a, hey, in this house, we have rules. And if you don't want to follow those rules, by all means. And my mom chose by all means. And she went to go live with my dad. Ultimately, they started having, they, they, they had some children. But my mom, and, and this is really important and really sad at the same time. My mom had the support of both her parents. There was no daddy issues. There was, daddy wasn't in the home. No excuses. She had the support of both parents. She was the youngest. If you're the youngest in here, you know you get special treatment. That's just how that works, all right? <laughs> That's, it's true. It's true. For some, re for some reason, right? So my mom had the support of not only her parents, but her whole family. They were together. They were a tight-knit unit. She was raised correctly. Her, my, my, my grandpa was always telling, I love you, I love you, I love you. They supported her in everything that she did. But she fell in love with my dad, right? And she chose, there's this ancient book of wisdom, right, that states relationships. It talks about relationships. And it says, for those, for that reason, falling in love with somebody, for that reason, a man will leave his parents the support of his parents, the care of his parents to go be one with his wife or partner to go be. So, so despite you taking care of me and supporting me and teaching me and, and all this love that you give me, if I find someone that I fall in love with, I will leave you to go be with that person. That's how strong relationship is. My mom chose to leave my parents to go be with that person. And the crazy thing is she knew better. But for some reason, she just couldn't put her foot down. And my dad ruined my mom. His influence was just way too strong. As awesome as she was, as smart as she was, his influence was just way too strong for her. So she started doing drugs. Three years later, she's a, she's, she's a drug addict. Dropped out of school, lost her job. One day, she had a mental breakdown. And my dad, being the stand-up guy he was, he was like, whoa. I didn't sign up for this. So what did he do? Peaced out. And he left my mom alone. She was physically and mentally unable to take care of her children, so she lost most of her children to foster care, including me. I was two months old when I entered foster care. Now, I don't remember much when I was two months old, and neither should you. And if you do, that's weird. It really is. <laughs> so my life really started when I was four. When I was four years old, I was in my first foster home. I didn't know anything about my mom. I didn't know anything about my dad, except for he had to be adorable, all right? Other than that, know nothing about him. All I knew was that this lady who took care of me was mom, this dude who took care of me was dad, and we had brothers and sisters. Now it was a foster home, so it was a mix of everybody. Right? A couple Mexicans, sprinkle a few Asians in there, two white kids and a black dude. That was me. It's like if you opened a bag of Skittles and you threw it, that was us. Just different flavors of the rainbow. But we all got along and we all got along well. Like scary well. My dad was the glue that kept that family together. Not only, well, now that I'm a dad, I know my dad had to be exhausted. But he walked through that front door between 5.30 and 6 o'clock every single day. He gave us the time and attention we needed as a family, but also as individuals. My mom was fortunate enough to be a stay-at-home mom. I don't know if her favorite thing was to cook, but she was always in the kitchen. You know, actually, now that I think about it, I think her favorite pastime was dinner. We had this long brown table, and we all had to sit in our assigned seats pretty much. And my dad would sit at the head of the table. My mom would sit right next to him. They would eat. And then my mom would hold my dad's hand just like this, kick back in her chair, and just listen to us and watch us with a smile on her face. That was her favorite thing. And then they worked so well as a couple. They would split the house up. 
On Monday, you know, on this side of the house, you know, mom would take care of the, the, the smaller ones and, and dad would take care of the older ones. And then on Tuesday, they would flip flop. So we got them both. Bedtime stories got to be tucked in and they loved each other, not just through words, but through actions. I never saw my, my parents argue, ever. I know they did, because they were married. Right, honey? All right, my wife is here. She would tell you. I'm like, really? We're arguing over dishes? She hates, she, she hates it. Hates, hates dishes in the sink in the morning. All right? So we'll argue over it. I'm like, you do realize that was yours, right? No, 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> but they never argued, and they loved each other. I don't know if I was a good kid or a spoiled kid, or maybe we had a lot of money. I'm not sure. But in my room, I had every toy imaginable, right? My room looked like Toys R Us on Black Friday, okay? Toys and electronics everywhere. Now, this is the early 90s, so you know Stretch Armstrongs, right? Sock and boppers. You remember that, right? Skip it, skip it. Yeah, let me take y'all back a little bit, you know? It's hilarious. One day, I'm outside. I'm playing handball with my boys. Y'all remember handball? Y'all play handball out here? Yeah? Let's take y'all back. Y'all got to relax. Handball. Remember slices? <laughs> All right? Black magic. <laughs> yeah, y'all remember that? Come on, bullet, right? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. I'm outside. I'm playing handball with my boys. It's time to go inside. Now, every day, I would do the exact same thing, okay? I'd run home, run up my steps, open up the door, hit a quick right, and there was my room. But on this particular day, I opened up the front door and I felt something that I never felt before. I described it as a warm, negative energy. We know it as tension. You ever felt tension before? Yeah? If you got a boss, yeah. <laughs> This was weird for me, because like I said, me and my family, we got along, and we got along well. So I'm thinking nothing of it. I'm going to my room, but before I get to my room, at the corner of my eye, I see my mom, and she's in the kitchen, and she's crying. Now, four-year-olds were nosy. You see your mom crying, what do you do? Yeah, you go see what's up. So I run to the kitchen, I wrap my arms around my mom's legs like four-year-olds do, and in my four-year-old voice, which doesn't sound too much different than this one, I, that one wasn't funny. <laughs> I look at my mom and I ask, what's wrong? And my mom, she looks at me with tears in her eyes, and she does what moms do best. Now moms have this talent, this skill, no one can do this better than they can. What is it? Lying, yes, thank you for being honest. You're liars. Yeah, absolutely, you're liars. And if you're looking at me all offended right now, right? how dare Dee talk about my mom? My mom doesn't lie, she's a Christian. Then she got you good, okay? Now don't get me wrong. We know it's not maliciously. It's not to cause harm, right? But when we're with child or we know we're gonna have a child, there's something in our brain that just changes and we don't want our kids to worry. So we're constantly making big things what? All the time. So I look at my mom, I'm like, mom, you good? Well, I didn't say that. Imagine a four-year-old, mom, you good? You straight? Everything copacetic, right? I'm like, mom, you okay? She looks at me, I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, cooking onions. I'm four years old, so I'm like, cool. That makes sense. Onions make you cry. So the next day, I'm outside in the neighborhood. I'm playing freeze tag with my boys. Y'all remember freeze tag? Right? So I'm outside, I'm playing.
Freeze tag with my boys. It's time to go inside. Now, every day I would do the exact same thing. I would run home, run up my steps, open up the door, hit a quick right, and there was my room. On this particular day, I opened up the door and I felt that tension again. Now, I was thinking, okay, I felt this yesterday. Mom said she was cooking onions. The logical conclusion would be, it's cooking onions. So I'm thinking nothing of it. So I go to my room, Toys R Us on Black Friday. And when I open up the door, nothing was in there. No clothes, no toys, no sheets on the bed, nothing. The only thing that was left was a suitcase and my other pair of shoes. Now I'm about four years old, so I'm about yay tall. And I remember this vividly standing in the middle of my door frame. And I see my mom come out of her room, tears running down her face. And she gets in this exact position and she holds both of my hands like this. And I go, mom, what's going on? Where's all my stuff? And my mom, she looks at me, she says, sweetheart, you're moving. I look at my mom and I ask, why? Right now, before I get to that point, I understand that my, my sisters aren't there. My dad isn't there. My brothers aren't there. So I'm like, okay, hurry up. We're waiting on you. And then she looks at me in a more serious voice. She says, no, sweetheart, you're moving. So I look at my mom and I ask why. And she knows I'm too young to understand the real reason to why I was leaving that day. So she did what moms do. And she made something bigger. What? The first thing that came to my mom's head that she felt would make sense to me was, I'm so sorry, son, there's just not enough room for you to live with us anymore. When you're four years old and your mom tells you there's not enough room for you to live in your own house, not only does it break your heart, but as a four-year-old, you think you're too what? Big. So in my four-year-old mind, I'm thinking of ways to make myself what? Smaller. So I look at my mom and I plead my case. Yo, mom, if somebody needs my snack, give it to me. I'm cool. I don't need to eat. And that didn't work. I said, mom, if somebody needs my bed, can't you just put my sleeping bag on the couch? I'll even sleep outside. And that didn't work. And the last thing I can come up with was an apology. I looked at my mom. I said, yo, mom, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I made you upset. I'm sorry if I made dad upset. I'll be a better son. If I'm too loud when I play with my toys, I'll be quiet. I promise you won't even know that I'm here. We can get rid of all of them if we need the room. I didn't mean to slam the door on the way in. I just wanted to let you know that I made it home in time. I don't want to go. I want to stay. And then I start to panic like, yo, where's dad? Call dad. Let him know. And before I could finish, my mom just broke down. And she was crying already. But something that I said really pulled on her heart. And she only had enough strength to lean over. And she grabbed me and she gave me the tightest hug. She grabbed me by my face. She kissed me on my forehead. She pressed her face against mine. I could feel the wetness on her cheeks. And she struggled to say, son, I love you. And that was the last time I ever saw her again. The social worker grabbed my hand, grabbed my stuff, strapped me into the car, and we drove off. You see, everything that I knew for four years of my life was gone, just like There's a few things that we need to know about this word resilience that I like to use, okay? In life, you have to be resilient. This is why I say resilience is everything, and it really is, okay? So if we can get that screen up there. There's, in life, there's three things that are going to cause you to be resilient, all right? Everyone say, my choices. Yeah, yeah. The choices that you make, if you think about your life today, the choices that you make can put you in a place where you now need to be resilient, all right? Everyone look at someone else and say, your choices. It's funny, that one's always louder. I'm like, say my choices. My choices. 
say your choices, your choices. But it's true. The things that other people do to you can put you in a place where you now need to be resilient, right? You got Mothers Against Drunk Driving. That was created because people decided, I'm gonna drink and I think it's a cool thing to drive and they hurt people. And it caused them to be resilient, their families to be resilient. And then you have this, natural disasters, acts of God, AKA things that are out of your control, right? Now, when you're dealing with children, children have a hard time, they mix up the first two boxes. This is why it's difficult for people to activate their resilience, okay? When you start mixing up these categories, and kids are known for people doing stuff to them and them taking the blame for it, right? Mom and dad get a divorce and kids go, oh, if I was, if I was a better son, if I was a better daughter, I could have prevented this. So it's hard for them to bounce back. It's hard for them to be more resilient because they keep mixing up these categories. Adults are known for this one, right? We like to mix up the third box because we love to control stuff, even though you know you can't control it. And for some of you in here, you're still holding on to stuff that you should have let go years ago because you're trying to fix things, you're trying to save people, I'm working it out for them, or so on and so forth. That's how we mix it up. So this is important because anytime you find yourself in a position where you now need to be resilient, just ask yourself these questions. Is this my choice? Something that I did? Something that someone else did to me? Or is this something out of my control? Now, if you can answer these questions, your ability to activate your resilience becomes a little easier, right? Because we all know, if this is my choice, something that I'm doing, who can fix it? You, right? So you know, right? Oh, I've been spending money. <laughs> you know, I've been spending too much money. Now I'm in debt, right? You can fix that. That's a you problem, okay? But maybe somebody hurts you down the line. You see, the me problem is the second easiest out of all these three, right? And we'll talk, we'll, we'll dive deeper in, in my master class. Sign up for that, right, Tia? Yeah, <laughs> right? We'll dive more into that. But this is the second easiest of these, right? Your choices, the things that people did to you, that's the hardest one of the three. See, that one requires forgiveness and work. Yeah, forgiveness and work. To sit there and say, you know what? You did this to me. You put me in this situation, but I have to forgive you. And now I have to do the work in order to be resilient, in order to, so you, you can only be resilient if you go through something, right? And the easiest out of all these is the natural disasters one. Just let it go. You can't control it. The funniest interview I've ever seen that, that, that solidifies this is Hawaii. I want to say 2000, I don't remember the exact date, 2009 or something like that, where the volcanoes started to erupt, right? You, ha you have this news anchor on the island. It, it, it destroyed a lot of land, destroyed a lot of homes. So you have this new news anchor. She's doing the interview. And she's just live here on the volcano site. We have... Mr. Johnson here, whose house was just demolished in this, this eruption and it just wiped everything out. Mr. Johnson, how do you feel? This man takes the mic and goes, I built my house on a volcano. You know, he's literally sitting there like, I know what I was doing. I, I built my house on a volcano. The volcano erupted without my permission and it destroyed my house. My, my thoughts were, yo, if you can build your house on a volcano in Hawaii, you can probably afford another one, right? But he knew this is out of my control. I'm pretty sure he had emotions, stuff in the house that he loved and things like that. But at the end of the day, he built his house on a volcano, right? 
So you got to let it go. Resilience, the dictionary definition of resilience is the ability, is the to easily adjust to misfortune or change. But you know, if life has thrown a curveball at you, it's not, we don't easily adjust to things. You need time. You need time by yourself. You need time with friends. You need time to ask questions. You need time to process the answers. You need time. So I don't like that definition, so this is mine. Resilience, the ability to bounce back. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah that hypes me up. Heck yeah. The ability to bounce back. All right, Boost, I need you to repeat after me. Resilience. You can do better than that. Resilience. The ability to bounce back. Each and every one of you has displayed a tremendous amount of resilience in order for you to be here today, whether you know it or not. The key word in this statement is ability. Ability. That means that you're capable of bouncing back from anything. I've seen it. Anything. But ability also means you have the opportunity to use it or not. Right now, we live in a time where more and more people are refusing to use this ability. The suicide rate, rate amongst your teens and your children has tripled. Tripled in the last five years. And, and before, early 90s, it was grown men, middle crisis men, and then it started to get younger, early 20s, now elementary school. 12-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 9-year-olds, taking their own life because life has been so difficult. Because they feel like no one understands them. That no one sees them. Kids having kids, and I'm one of them. I had my daughter when, I'm when I was 19, clueless. And now I'm trying to raise a kid, and I made a lot of mistakes doing that. And luckily, she's very resilient and, and is 17 now. Lord, help me. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not too proud to be up here and tell you that I'm, I'm a perfect dad or a perfect husband or a perfect friend or anything like that. I've made a lot of mistakes and I will continue to make a lot of mistakes, but I have an ability, a superpower to bounce back from my mistakes, to learn from those mistakes and say, I want to do better. But it was difficult when I was a toddler. So now I'm in this new foster home. I have a new mom, new dad, new brothers, new sisters, new school. Over time, they start telling me that they love me. I start telling them that I love them. They call me son. I call them mom and dad. Then one day it's like deja vu. My stuff is packed and I'm moving again. So I get to this new home, new mom, new dad, new brother, new sister, new school. Over time, they start telling me that they love me. I start telling them that I love them. They call me son. I call them mom and dad. Then one day my stuff is packed and I'm moving again. So now I get to this new home. It's just me and this lady. No husband, no kids, a simple life, really. But she doesn't know I moved three times already. So when it comes to new people, I'm a little standoffish. She takes it as, I don't want to be there. So I remember driving with her or going with her to the agency. And she's in the office and I'm in the lobby playing with that little thing, you know, with the, the beads on it. Pointless, pointless toy. It's absolutely pointless. There's no end game in that. <laughs> there is, there's not. You just sit there and you just do the same thing over and over again. And it, Okay, now it makes sense. Yeah. Some adult was just like, oh, this is a waste of time. Let's give it to kids. <laughs> I'm sitting in that office and I can hear her talking to the caseworker, she says, you know what? I've done everything I can to make him feel loved, to make him feel welcomed. He's just not happy here. So what happens? Stuff is packed, but I'm moving again. 
So now, I'm in the back of my social worker's car. And I'm sad. I'm actually excited because I figured it out. I had an epiphany. You see, every time I get to a new home and I tell them that I love them and they tell me that they love me and they call me son and I call them mom and dad, every single time that happens, I move. So in order for me to stay, in order for me to have a family, what do I need to do? The exact opposite. Oh, I'm so hyped. I'm so geeked up. Why? Because I get a mom. I get a mom to take me to the grocery store where I'm hanging on the cart and it says don't hang on the cart, right? I get a dad that takes me to Little League, pushes me on the swing at the park, right? I get sister and brothers I can fight with and pick on. I get relatives from all over the country that come to one central location to celebrate the holidays. I get a tree, a Christmas tree with ornaments that I made in elementary school hanging from it. I get presents with my name on it. I get that family portrait hanging above the fireplace where everybody's like. So I'm ready. So I get to this new home. Over time, like, we love you. I'm like, I hate you. Come down for dinner, no. Hold my hand, no. Stop saying no, no. Now, if you know anything about foster care, if you get to a home where they can't control you, what happens? Your stuff is packed and you're moving again. It was at that point in my life where I fell into the state of hopelessness. Hopelessness is the world's most dangerous place to be in. It's why we drowned our problems in drugs and alcohol. It's why we hurt ourselves. It's why we hurt other people. It's why we run away. It's why we join gangs. It's the onset of mental, uh, or, or mental health. There's so many things. See, hopelessness is I don't care if there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You see how dangerous that is? If you need to know the effects of hopelessness, turn on the news for five minutes and you'll get an example. I was eight years old when I fell into the state of hopelessness. I didn't care about myself. I didn't care about anybody else. As a matter of fact, I felt like a piece of trash. You take them. I don't want them. You take them. I don't want them. You take them. I don't want them. You take them. I don't want them to the point where my own parents decided to do drugs over raising their little boy. I was sad. Alone. I was scared. I was frustrated. I had a million questions and no one was giving me the answers. And all of those emotions started to manifest into behavior. Let me say that again. Unchecked emotion manifests into behavior. Some of y'all got kids acting out and you take it personal. Cause you know, no one wants to go to work and get cussed at. But what you don't realize is that, that that's not them being disrespectful. That's them crying for help. What you don't know is that, that that's not them being rude and whatever. That's them saying, hey, I've been dealing with this for a very long time and no one has seen me. They just keep kicking me out or turning their back on me or telling me to be quiet or telling me to put my head down or telling me to leave. And no one is saying, yo, what happened to you? No one is saying, yo, come here. Talk to me. Let's get this out. And if you think kids are going to walk up to you, I don't know about you, but I don't know many seven or eight year olds that will walk up to you and say, hey, Miss Quinn, I'm having a rough day. I think I'm going to need to take a break every now and then, just walk around the school or something to get my mind together. And if you know any seven year olds like that, he's a genius. They don't work that way. We don't either. Right. As humans, we don't either. So here I am. 
I'm in class. I decide I'm going to be a jerk. I put my feet on the desk. Teacher goes, D, get your feet off the desk. I'm like, oh, my bad. Take my feet off. But now I have the classroom's attention. So every time I turn around, to, my, tur- my teacher turns around to teach, what am I doing? I'm like, yo, watch this. Right, pretending to count those holes in the ceiling. They still have that? Yeah? <laughs> then I get caught. She goes, that's it, D. I'm putting your name on the board. Now, early 90s, you get your name written on the board, worst thing that can ever happen to you. What does the class do? Well, nowadays, your students laugh because they're brutal and heartless. But back then, ready? One, two, three. I was going through so much that day that it literally felt like when the class was going, ooh, somebody was pouring boiling hot water into my body. Just go, 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 go. All of a sudden, I exploded. I looked at my teacher. I said, you did what? I kicked my desk. Bah! Flipped over my chair. Bah, you stupid teacher. Man, F this class. Y'all don't know anything about me. I hate all y'all. Little kid looking at me like, what is going on? What you looking at, fool? Bah! Kick open the door. Boom. I'm flipping everybody off. Your finger's like this big in elementary school. Right? And I'm hot. I'm so mad. And you... <laughs> If you, if you service black students, especially black males, you know this very well. This is how we get mad. Ooh, ooh, I swear, man, you don't know me, man. Right? So I'm sitting there. I get to my vice principal's office. I'm like, stupid teacher. Write my name on the board. I hate this school. And I'm thinking, I don't want to be here. They don't want me here. I'm in trouble every day. So I look at her and I get, why don't you just send me home? And there she is. She's at her desk. She's writing. Put your pen down. She hears that. Why don't you just send me home? She walks up to me. She gets down to my level just like this. She looks me right into the eyes and she says, because you have potential. Now, immediately I clear up and I'm like, let me analyze this real quick. I kicked my desk, I'm pretty sure I cut Frank and Jesse in half, flipped over my chair, I cussed out my teacher, I slapped two innocent bystanders, kicked open the door, flipped everybody off, came in here, yelled at my vice principal, and the only thing this lady has to say is, you have potential? I'm like, lady, I'm eight. What does potential mean? But if I were to see her today, I'd give her the biggest hug. Not only was because she was correct, but because of what she did for me that day. And she did three amazing things. First one was, she got down to my level. She got down to my level, human to human. She could have easily been like, man, little boy, shut up. Second thing she did, eye contact. I'll never forget this day. And the last thing that she did was this. I was always in her office, meaning she never sent me where? Home, which showed me that she went care. You see, one of the most amazing things that can happen is finding someone who sees everything you are and won't let you be anything less. They see the potential of you. They see endless possibilities. And through their eyes, you start to see yourself the same way as someone who matters, as someone who can make a difference in this world. You are here because you believe someone matters. I am here because I believe I matter because of you and the work that you do. But this is what she also told me, without even using words, and I'm gonna tell all of you the same thing. And this is why I don't want you professionals in here today, I just want you. You see, right here in this room, with all of you adults, I know for a fact that some of you had parents that were married 10, 15, 20 years, And then one day they sat you and your siblings on the couch and said, you know what, we can't do this anymore. And it hurts you to the core. I know for a fact that some of you may have been in foster care like I was right here in this room. Some of us, mom, dad divorced, mom remarried some jerk. He doesn't like you, you don't like him. Treated his kids like gold, treated you like trash. That's right here in this room. Some of you had parents that that were incarcerated or, 
are no longer with us. For some of you, grandma, grandpa, they were the closest to you. They loved you the most. They gave you the most. But then their time came and they passed away. It left a hole in your heart. That's right here in this room. Some of you have been abused physically, mentally, verbally, and the other 50 kinds right here in this room. Some of you look into the mirror, you hate what you see because somebody told you weren't this enough or you weren't that enough. That's right here in this room. Some of you don't even talk to your parents anymore. You don't even know why it's been so long right here in this room. Ex-alcoholics, drug addicts, maybe we've been incarcerated at some point in time. Right here in this room, we've been hurt, we've been let go, we've been betrayed, we've been disrespected. Right here in this room. I know for a fact that y'all wake up every day, you get dressed, you walk out of your house, and you grab this mask. And not the one we wear for COVID. This mask where we're laughing and joking in front of our friends and our colleagues and we're acting like everything is all good, but inside we're broken. That's right here in this room. Now let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. If you're going through it as adults and you can't even handle your emotions, I've seen you. I've seen you drive to work, tears in your eyes, mascara everywhere. And then you drive into your parking lot, you reapply, you wipe your tears, and you go do your job from nine to five. And as soon as you clock out, you're right back to crying. You can't even handle your emotions. Imagine what your kids are going through. I want to share something with you before we end this. I know it's been tough for a lot of you out there. Trust me, it's been tough for me too. I know there's a lot of stuff that you haven't dealt with, but it's starting to eat you alive. It's starting to break you down. Every year it gets worse and worse and worse. It gets harder and harder and harder because you haven't dealt with it. You haven't done the right things to, 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 to move on, to, to do what you need to do to activate your resilience. But if you're here right now, if you can hear me, if you can see me, that means that you're alive. And if you're alive, that means that your problems and situations didn't kill you. And if they didn't kill you, that means that life has given you another opportunity to be amazing. If you're here right now, if you can hear me, if you can see me, that means that you are alive. And if you're alive, that means that your problems and situations didn't kill you. And if they didn't kill you, that means that you're stronger than what you think you are. Is it not? That means you're more resilient than what you think you are. That means that you're right here, right where you're supposed to be, right here in this room. Statistically, I shouldn't be here. I was in 12 different foster homes and two different group homes by the time I was 12 years old. I never met my dad before in my life. My mom passed away in 2018, so both of my parents are non-existent. 50% of us drop out of school, high school. Of that 50%, 12% go on to college. Of that 12%, 2 to 3% graduate. I was 10 times more likely to end up in prison than to ever step foot on a college campus. Prison, not jail. I'm a criminal justice major. So let me, let me break this down for you. Despite what you think, prison is very difficult to get into. It, it really is. College is not. So when they say I was 10 times more likely to end up in prison than to ever step foot on a college classroom, it did something to me. And despite the statistics, I did graduate high school at the top of my class-ish. From high school, I went straight to California State University, Long Beach, go beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from there, my dad, or who I call dad now, told me my talent, showed me my talent. And he said, D, if you take your talent for speaking and your story and you put those two together, you can really do some good in this world. So I took his advice. So I'm here to tell you this. If you're here today, after hearing my story, sharing a little bit of your story, you are living proof that yes, life throws curveballs. 
but even curveballs can be hit for home runs. I appreciate y'all. My name is D. Hankins. Thank y'all so much for allowing me to be here. Tia, love you. Michelle, love you. Wifey, love you. Nobly, love you. <laughs> Thank y'all. <laughs>